we all know the music and we all know the words, but there's something else going on there that I think is um, is core to our existence. And by the way, you did say it was about being human, but I just have to say how much I enjoy watching YouTube videos of cockatoos enjoying rock and roll music. <laughs> Well, hello there. I am Cool Gray, and this is Cool Gray in Studio A. Welcome back to the podcast. We are in episode six, which is actually part five of the first series. And that series is called Creativity Born of Trauma. If you're just joining me for the first time, I would encourage you to go back to certainly episode two to get the beginning of this series and to uh, meet all of the guests that I've brought you so far. Today, we're talking with Emma Nottage about music as um, a creative expression that can come out of trauma, as something that can be used in a therapeutic way to help in healing from trauma, and also as a fundamental element of the universe, which I believe Emma and I are on the same page about. Keep listening for more information about that. And we do have one more guest coming up in this series before we break for the holidays. Then we'll be back in 2023 with my second series, Personal Paranormal Encounters. You do not want to miss those guests. So please, wherever you listen, wherever you watch, plug in, subscribe, stay on top of things so that you don't miss another episode. All of the links that you would need to find and follow me and this podcast everywhere can be found in the show notes. I'm just going to take a short break right now, and then we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Stay tuned. Hey, Cool Gray here. I want to talk to you for just a minute about Patreon. Patreon is a social media platform where you can support this podcast, my YouTube channel, and other artists who are doing what I'm doing, which is making stuff happen on our own dime, on our own time. This is a way that you can support those efforts. And if you're enjoying this podcast, I would encourage you to join me over there. Not just because it helps me, but there are perks, people. Let me tell you what those are. At the very first tier of support, just $5 a month, you will get 24 hours advance access to every single episode in its audio format. At the $10 level and above, you will get a full video version of every single episode. That is not available anywhere else. Why is that amazing? Well, you'll be able to learn such things as what do my guests even look like, especially when they're talking? Did I apply my eyeliner evenly? Am I wearing the same outfit? as I was last episode. Do I have broccoli in my teeth? These are the things that are burning in your souls. I know you want to know the answers and that's where you can find out. If you're not feeling goofy, I can also tell you that you'll get exclusive access to bonus content, not available anywhere else, monthly mini-sodes and quarterly blooper reels. I am also offering fan access. You can make requests. You can say, hey, Cool Gray, make a mini-sode about this or why don't you talk about that? And I will listen to you. I may not actually do it, but I will listen to you. I I am doing everything that you see here from the writing to the editing to the recording to the promotion to the graphics it's all me by myself and i'm just really trying to cover my costs i would love to welcome you over there to become a part of this exclusive community that gets all the nifty stuff that the rest of you are missing out on so come on over to patreon.com find me as cool gray studios there's a link in the show notes that will take you there more directly and i thank you for considering that I'd like to introduce my guest today. Emma Nottage is a highly rated motivational speaker with 21 years of experience as a primary school teacher and 17 years as a private one-to-one -one music tutor for all ages. In 2020, she reinvented herself as a global online music tutor and fully embraced the online world, working from her base in Devon, United Kingdom. In 2021, she became a best-selling collaborative author after contributing a chapter about resilience in life and business, and she's currently writing a book about music and well-being. Emma is an APC-accredited life coach, and she's passionate about how music can support mental health and build confidence, and also about music's true value in education and society. She loves helping her coaching clients conquer their limiting beliefs, set smart goals, and move forward positively in life. She has spoken in Facebook groups, on podcasts, and at online summits, and she's also been a guest blog writer and featured in online media publications. Emma would also like you to know that she loves elephants and the color purple, 
These are things that I share with you, Emma. Thank you so much for being here today. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for the invitation, Lynn. I love that you include a touch of whimsy in your bio. Uh, I am all about the whimsy. Uh, I would even go so far as to say I'm a complete goofball. Uh, my audience has heard me say that more than once and not sorry. <laughs> no, it's good to show all sides of us, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Plus, yeah. purple's an awesome color. <laughs> My husband is a is an elephant fan as well. He uh he will often show me little Instagram reels of baby elephants. Uh okay. <laughs> yeah, he, he's my type of guy. Yeah, you'd love him. <laughs> so you are in the UK. Yes. I am right. not. I'm over on the other side of the pond, as they say. And when I think of the UK and I think of music, I have enough gray hairs to actually remember something called the British Invasion, when all of you wonderful musicians came over here and, in my opinion, basically reminded us of our own musical roots. And now I, I'm skipping ahead a little bit to the 70s or such when we had bands like Led Zeppelin coming over and bringing back the blues to us. And we thought it was something so novel. But going back even further, there was Beatlemania when I don't know that a single one of those young ladies in those stadiums even heard a single note that they sang uh, because of the screaming. But uh, I'd love to hear your opinion of what in the world do you think happened there uh, <laughs> to create such a phenomenon? Yeah, well, um, I'm a little bit younger than those days, but I know about it as a musician. Um, I think it was partly to do with like an explosion of culture after the Second World War. Uh, where things had been more austere. I think there was a new freedom that came. Looking at it from the other direction, here in the UK, in the 1950s, with Elvis and people like the rock and roll stars, we were looking at you guys and thinking, wow, this is fresh and amazing. And... Um, you know, you had the birth of the teenager, like with the um, the milk bars and the jukeboxes. And I think sort of that got our imagination going here. All the and way back in the, in the 50s. In the 50s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then in the 60s, again, you've got young people sort of going their own way. And I think they just wanted to do something new again, like the Beatles from Liverpool, which wasn't really on the map suddenly they were the phenomenon over in the states did it feel that way in the uk do you know i think it did yeah um they 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 are known as sort of the i don't know the the influential band that changed everything here yeah. i think that's universal yeah. yeah you can't be a musician and not <laughs> feel that uh influence for sure did you, uh, did you grow up in a musical family? Yes, yes, I did. My mum used to play the piano and she still has a lovely singing voice. She's, she's in her 80s now and, and my father's that old as well. Um, he has never really been musical and he's always found it quite hard to hold a tune, but he likes to sing with gusto. Um, my elder sister is a clarinetist um, and my brother dabbled with guitar and drums, but he's more a listener. I grew up with um, his music in his bedroom of the rock bands like Rainbow, Deep Purple, the sort of heavier rock that he liked at that time. But yeah, so I was brought up in a very musical house musicians talent but also we had a, a record player a radiogram and we had a big selection of records and we used to listen to the radio so there was always music in the house right from my birth I when I was born my parents bought the song Isn't She Lovely by David Parton I know that Stevie Wonder sang it as yes. well 
and that was like my song as a baby and I was rocked in my crib to um, the floral dance which is a traditional brass band tune from the West Country down in Cornwall. I think that's probably where my love of music comes from, partly. I think it's wonderful when you grow up in a house full of music and uh, I can relate to the <laughs> having a brother with a taste that doesn't necessarily match your own. My, my brother was six years younger than me and I was uh, a top 20 girl. I grew up, you know, listening very much to popular music in the 70s. And my brother was doing the Black Sabbath and the Aerosmith and the harder rock bands. And that, of course, cannot be played at any kind of reasonable volume or there's no point. So we spent a lot of time using a broom handle to bang on the ceiling, which was his bedroom floor, like doing the turn it down thing all the time. I was not a Led Zeppelin fan until he told me if I did a favor for him, he would take me to the concert of my choice. This is when I was maybe 19. So he was maybe 14, something like that. And so I did him the favor. He said, okay, what concert would you like to see? And I said, I'd like to go see Hall and & Oates. And he said, I wouldn't be caught dead at a Hall & Oates concert. My, I can't possibly be seen there. I'm taking you to see Robert Plant. He's got Phil Collins playing drums for him. That's where we're going. So he hijacked that whole experience. But I've been a Robert Plant fan ever oh. since. <laughs> so I'm going to thank him for that. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit. That, that whole thing about not being seen dead, that was my brother. In the 1980s, when I was growing up, I got into sort of like electro-pop type music and I really liked the Pet Shop Boys. Mm -hmm. And I asked for their discography album, like all their big hits. Um, for, I think it was for Christmas or my birthday. And my brother bought it for me, but he when he gave it to me, he said... Oh, I was so embarrassed. He said, <laughs> I, I had to buy a rainbow album at the same time and say it's not for me, you know. <laughs> this um, one's a gift. Just just ignore yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. I get it. Oh, that's hilarious. Oh, what is your uh, musical instrument of choice? How many do you play? I started off, like many of us in primary school, on the recorder. Of course. And, and, and then I progressed and I had piano lessons from when I was seven. Um, but it was when I was 12 years old that I started to play the French horn, um, the curly whirly brass instrument. Not an easy instrument, is it? Wow. No, How that's, ambitious. <laughs> that's what many people say. I always say it, it is when you can play it, it's not hard. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I, yeah, so the French horn is probably my favourite instrument that I play um, because it's so mellow, the sound. Um, the thing that led me to it was Prokofiev's Peter and the Wolf because the wolf is a trio of horns. And I was like, that's what I want to play. That's the sound you connected with. I actually yeah. had that album as a child and uh, listened to it before I even knew that it was uh, culturally significant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It just sounded like fun to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then over the years since that, I've gone on and learned different instruments. Um, and, I, and I'm a music tutor, as you shared earlier. And I teach a whole range of things from the piano to brass instruments, um, guitar, violin, and I'm also a singer. So I had my voice trained, um, but I naturally sang as well. And- um, With gusto, like your father? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, but um, more tunefully, uh -huh. <laughs> I, can, I can say that. I used to say, everybody can sing apart from my father, and then a few years ago, I felt really convicted by that. And I change what I say now. And I say, everybody can sing, even my dad, in his own way. Because I believe that we all have a unique voice. And it can be developed in all of us. But, but we're all valuable. You know, I, I think that words 
can damage us. And this is a lot of what I now do is helping people get over those negative past experiences with much more positive experiences of music. Yeah, and I think the whole idea of encouraging people in order to bring out the best of them and to uh, compensate for maybe some of the negative things that have been uh, spoken to them in their lives, that's a relatively new, newly embraced concept. I know it's a running joke in my family. I've always been a Augusto singer myself, um, which is not to say I have a trained voice by any stretch, but if you put me in a position where I can open my mouth and belt, I will. And I, <laughs> I'm i not really so concerned about the result as much as the expression itself. Uh, I have a sister who's a year younger than me whose favorite phrase when we were growing up was to say to me, Lynn, there is a time and a place for singing and it is not around me. <laughs> and, and that's a joke that we still share today. And it's funny mm -hmm. But it did inhibit me. You know, mm -hmm. I, I went to art school for several years because my dad was a very talented artist. I've, I, I'm an artist today. But when I went to art school, that training said to me, you should not make art. And so I didn't for about 30 years, told myself I wasn't good enough. I, I didn't have the natural talent. And, and when I came back to it, the whole world had changed and art isn't even the same as it was then. What's considered valid, what's considered valuable, it has a lot more to do with what people are connecting to emotionally when they come in contact with a creation of any kind, whether it's music or art. And so I love where we're going with that. Do you find that there are particular instruments that are, I guess I want to say easier to tutor from, that are a tool that more effectively brings out those things that might be hidden away in a person? I don't know if there's like a, a one that's better than the other, but from experiences that I've had over the last few years of working with adult students, they gravitate more to piano and also voice because particularly voice, there are so many people with stories a little bit like yours who have had the whole thing of, you can't sing in the school choir, you're not good enough, or, you know, that, that whole thing of saying, oh, no, that's a horrible noise. But something inside them has been squashed and they, they have a desire that they want to sing and to share, but they've, they've been stopped. And it seems that quite often sort of in midlife, and particularly in women, that they're almost like, stepping out and saying I want to try and I love helping that blossom then. Sure and um, I think maybe when we're in those circumstances where those negative things have been spoken to us those instructors may be thinking in terms of their next recital or whether or not you have the potential to make this your livelihood and it, it isn't so much about just bringing out the soul of that person and, and freeing them to express themselves. I don't personally feel connected to the whole participation trophy approach to education either. I do think we have to strive for excellence and that there's value yeah. in that. Yeah. But at the same time, there's definitely a path we can walk where we don't crush people in the process. Oh. A hundred, a hundred percent. I agree with that, you know, about the latest, well, it's not latest, it's been the last decade, really, talent shows, um, televised things. I know here and there we have like the X Factor, right. Britain, Americans got talent. And I think particularly like the stage at auditions, when people go and they don't have the talent and they're almost ridiculed, it really upsets me that I think, well, somebody said to them, go, go and do it. You'll be great. Right. But, but we need to protect people as well, because like if they don't get through, then that's really damaging for them. 
Yeah. And I don't think that's necessarily being considered. I mean, even Simon Cowell has softened over the years. Yes. But at the end of the day, that is a television program and it is a competition. And I think that's a very different reason to be expressing yourself in that way. And then, of course, there are, you know, the scads of people that show up at those shows just to make a fool of themselves and they have no intention. Uh, And there might be some damage there, too. You know, why? Would you want to do that, you know, and uh, in some ways make a clown of yourself if comedy isn't really your act? Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we we shouldn't be squashing each other, but we should also be encouraging people to know if this is something you seriously want to make a living at, then this is the kind of training you need. If we're going to gather around a fire pit and, you know, get in touch with our ancestral roots, (laughs) that's a whole different kind of singing. And uh, you don't have to be pitch perfect to do that. No, no. I mean, in my teaching of all the instruments, including voice, I emphasize that I develop my students musical skill because that is important sure but also their confidence so the two things go hand in hand are they mostly interested in doing music professionally or are they coming to you just because they want to undo that squashing damage i think it starts off as just wanting to undo and express but then Some people have gone on a journey and embraced music in a new way that's opened new doors for them. I'll just share a quick couple of stories with that. Yes, do, yeah. But this first lady, she knew me and she knew what I did. And she said, you know, I really want to sing, Emma, for my son's wedding. But she'd had a bad experience of school days where she hadn't been allowed in the choir and she'd been very low self-esteem from that. And she said, you know, I'm really nervous, but can we try? And I was like, yeah, of course. And I nurtured her through that. She had a lovely voice when we found it and opened it up. She chose a song. It was called The Man You've Become. And we actually recorded it and made a music video of a montage of her son's life because she she felt she couldn't do it live because she might break down. And they played it at the reception. Oh. And the only other person who knew was her husband. So it was a complete surprise. Oh, my. There wasn't a dry eye in the house. She sang beautifully. She'd found this new skill, this new love. And then she went on to take piano lessons from me. So she started to learn how to read music. She got a new skill. And she's somebody who's sort of later than midlife, really. So, you know, it's really exciting. And then I had another female student who had been a singer in her past but something had happened to knock that confidence. And I got her going again. And I got an amazing message a few weeks ago from her saying, thank you so much. I just want to share with you that I'm just about to start a new business venture with my partner as wedding singers. Oh, wow. And I was just like, oh, that's what it's all about helping people find that skill and that love and use it, you know. So success stories, one of those is to go in a professional direction and the other was just a much more personal thing. So much value in that work. I'm wondering when in your bio, you were saying that you really started out working with primary school uh, students and that it was as you started working with adults, you began to notice this need to um, undo some damage and to help people rediscover their voice. When did you first see the need to use your, uh, to, to go toward coaching and to incorporate those techniques into what you were doing with adult students? Yeah, so that that's right. I I majority of my career was with children and young people. But then a few years ago and pre-pandemic, I started locally some adult students. And then in the pandemic, I went online 
and you know the world was opened and more adult students came to me but it was working with all of them really I, I noticed this trend that it was almost like why have you waited this long to to do this if you wanted to do it and then it was seeing that there's underneath things that were preventing them and sadly quite often it's these backstories of someone in authority or even your peers you know ribbing you my sister <laughs> even your sister i forgive I her <laughs> i have another student who told me the same story with her i think it was not her sister i think it was her aunt and you know that close family connection but had said a very similar thing about mm. oh i don't like that noise or you know and it stays with you and I had a, my own story from childhood, because although I am really musical, there was one point in my musical life that didn't go the way I wanted it to instantly. And that was when I was at primary school myself, probably about nine years old, I wanted to play the acoustic guitar and I had an audition to do it and I remember it was like a conveyor belt of children going in to go and have a go and be told yes or no and I remember that the teacher made a split decision that I didn't hold the instrument correctly and I didn't get that opportunity and although it's not fresh in my memory I know because I am quite a sensitive person. It made an indelible mark on it you. Made an, sure. It made an indelible mark and I would have been upset at the time, but I didn't let it hold me back. And I went on, as you know, to learn the French horn at 12 years old. And the full circle is when I was teacher training, I taught myself to play the acoustic guitar. And it's now one of the instruments that I teach. Good for you. <laughs> I want to hasten to add, because I know my sister is going to listen to every single episode that uh, because we are siblings and because a big part of being siblings is to try to torture each other as much as possible. Uh, I never did stop singing. <laughs> ah. I didn't get any better, but I did get louder, especially when I was near her. <laughs> hmm. And it's part of the way we express our love for one another. So oh, definitely, I, I don't and want her feeling badly. <laughs> you just reminded me I shared with you I have an older sister as well and the running joke in our family when I was growing up particularly in my teenage years when I was processing teenage angst was I'd go to the piano and it was this piano I've had this piano since I was young so it's it's my friend it's been with me all the way and I used to go to the piano and make up music and quite often it was in a minor key and uh, quite dramatic. Very angsty. <laughs> and my sister used to say, oh, we can tell Emma's in a mood again because she's playing that meaningful music. And I remember at the time, I probably got quite riled up by that. <laughs> but I've learned to appreciate that that's exactly what I was doing. It was a healthy outlet for the emotions that I was going through, through the difficult times, through that angst, you know, your raging hormones and all of that. And I was channeling that into music, into creativity. Mm -hmm. And I also think that throughout our life, music can help us do that. Certainly so. You're talking about creative expression as a way to process some of the more challenging moments in our lives. What you're describing certainly doesn't sound like trauma, but this particular series that I'm in right now with the podcast being called Creativity Born of Trauma, there's really two sides to the coin. And I've been exploring both of them in this series. One is to use some form of creative expression, whatever that looks like for you, uh, to actually work out what you're feeling. And this podcast is my way of doing that right now, just by talking to people about trauma. I've just come through a very recent one. And I woke up one morning and said, oh my gosh, I, I have to start a podcast. It isn't something that had been in my brain 
until now. And when I talked about that with my therapist, she's the one that pointed out to me, has it ever occurred to you that this could be a trauma response? And it had not occurred to me until she said it. And it was an immediate, of course, that's what's happening here. Uh, So this is my creative expression. It's a skill set I already had, and I just branched into a new area. But to use creative expression as an intrinsic part of the healing process seems to me to be where this journey has taken you. So talk to me, if you would, a little bit about the two sides of that coin. Yeah, thank you. Definitely. So it's interesting when you said, oh, that doesn't sound like trauma. I, I know it's, it's, it's quite at the moment, there's quite a thing going on about a discussion about what trauma is. Yeah. And, and there are smaller things. Little that, T traumas and big yeah, T traumas. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't have to be the huge thing. Right. Because it's a, like a culmination of things through our life. It can be. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I just thought I'd throw that in there. Yes, thank um, you. But I've had the big things as well. I'm very open and honest and um, I've shared before, so I'm happy to now. Um, five years ago, I actually had some major surgery because I ex- experienced an ectopic pregnancy and I am thankful to be here to share with you today because I might not have been. After surgery, I woke woke up to be told, we've saved your life. Oh, dear. And that that does something to you, you know. Um, Certainly since that, that day, I'm a lot more pragmatic. Um, I have that sort of thing. It is what it is. We can't change things, but we can move forward and we can choose how we react to things. But going back to music related to that, certainly my musical expression after that event, I was very thankful for. Listening to music is very powerful. There have been studies done that if you listen to just 20 minutes of your favourite kind of upbeat music. It can turn your mood around from somewhere quite low to somewhere much more positive. And it stays there. It's quite long term. And this is because, I love sharing this, so it lights me up, but the brain science behind it, the fact that when we listen to music, and even more so when we're actually involved in the physical act of making that music, it releases our feel-good chemicals of oxytocin, our endorphins, our dopamine and serotonin like we get when we go out in the sunshine. And at the same time, it lowers our stress-making hormones of adrenaline and particularly cortisol. So I love this fact that it's this win-win to touch on those two sides of music that comes out of trauma and music therapy that uses music as a healer for trauma. So if you look at pop composers or rock composers that we all know, so many of them actually had traumatic pasts. If you think about Elvis Presley, and I don't know if you've seen the new movie, but um, it certainly, obviously it's Hollywoodized. Right. But it has, but it has a lot of his family history in. And, you know, he had quite a difficult life. His mother died when he was quite young. And Tom Petty, who my husband really likes his music, was someone who had a lot of anger because of his traumatic past. He was like rejected by his father. Again, his mother died when he was young and he channeled that into his ambition. Other people, I love Freddie Mercury. Oh gosh, I'm with you there. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. I, I grew up with Queen and I love Freddie Mercury, but he had a traumatic childhood 
because he was in boarding school and didn't have connections and and had a survival instinct and, and i believe they, he had to deal with some racism as well being in the uk yeah. as a pakistan or he wasn't pakistani was he, he was lebanese i think or um, egyptian no he's from um i want to get this right i want to say um zanzibar zanzibar um, that's correct i think, I think yes. that's right yes and his parents were parsi as their sort of religion right and and yeah he experienced racism and then obviously as well with through with his sexuality and and what came out afterwards you know but he was an amazing person for sure um, and but even Mozart, I've got Mozart up here on the top of my piano. He was the Freddie Mercury of his day. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yes. And he died young. Um, he was almost like a performing monkey as a child, made to perform and that type of thing. You know, so I think there is this whole thing you've probably heard as well about the 27 Club. Yes, most of those artists who like live fast and die young, so many of them had traumatic pasts. Yes. So it seems that trauma can burst or give birth to creativity and almost amazing genius creativity. But obviously at the same time, that wasn't happiness for them. Yeah, it seems to me as though it was a form of self-therapy, except that they were not able to access the real therapeutic value of it. They didn't even realize that it was self-soothing behavior. Uh, and you're here to kind of bridge that gap with your students, it seems now. I'm not a music therapist. I have to make that clear sure. because it, you have to have like a special degree. But certainly I can use music in coaching or have therapeutic aspects to my work. And I am fascinated by how music is used with great effect in many different situations. Music therapy can be used with abuse victims. I know that personally, Lynn, we've spoken earlier about dementia and um, cognitive degeneration. There's been so much research done lately about how music helps the brain stay young. And there are beautiful videos that you can find on YouTube and things where people in care homes, the elderly, who are suffering with things like dementia and Alzheimer's, and are usually in quite a sort of locked in state. They've recently done a thing where they have given these residents little iPods and they fill them with their music and it's music from their past. And when they put them on, they're like a different person. Yeah, they come alive. I've seen some of those videos. That's right. You know, they're yeah. tapping their toes, they're smiling. And singing they're along. Singing along. You were talking earlier about brain chemistry and brain anatomy. So you may know more about this than I do, but from my own personal observations with some elderly people that I've been caring for in my family in the past, particularly my mother-in-law, that the way that our brains process music seems to be kind of hardwired like written into our our genetic code or something i can watch someone virtually disappear before my eyes not be able to recall their words the names of things the names of people uh they don't remember things that we talked about yesterday but you start playing their favorite song or singing in the car with them and they are right there they know every single word and it's and and the joy just kind of bubbles out of them. And it's such a thing to behold, such a thing. What do you know about the way our brain uh, processes music? Yeah, so music is the one discipline that lights up the whole of our brain at one time. 
not just one hemisphere or the other. Fascinating. But all of our brains, so the logical and the creative and, and parts connected with memory and things like that. There's always a connection between like music and nostalgia and music and our emotions. And, you know, if you listen to a certain song, it can take you back to a time or a place or a feeling that you had when perhaps you first heard that song. And I think that's what's stored in us. I think uh, to, for me, it feels like there's a connection between cadence or melody and memory. I know if I hear a song that I haven't heard in 40 years, I haven't been exposed to that song in forever. And if you were just having a conversation with me and say, hey, Lynn, do you remember the lyrics to this song? I will say no. But if you play the opening music, mm -hmm. I will have every verse every line, all the little nuances. I know where the bridge is. <laughs> I know how yeah, many times the chorus yeah. is sung and where they swapped out an alternate line. It'll be right there, immediately yeah. available. And it has to do with hearing those opening notes. Whereas if I was just having a conversation with you, I may not be able to recall that. So mm. it's just fascinating to me how that works in us. And there's got to be, yeah. I feel, some higher purpose that's that can't be an accident. There's got to be some core fundamental value. I know I mentioned to you earlier when we were talking in before we started recording that I've heard astronauts come back and say the cosmos sings. They're out on a spacewalk and they're able to hear space singing. Yeah, I, I mean, that really intrigued me because um, back it, back in the ancient world, Plato in ancient Greece, he said something very similar when he talked about the music of the spheres. Yes. I truly believe that music is at the heart of our universe. Hundred, hundred percent. Um, I know in my bio, you read that one of my things is about re-establishing music's true value in education but also in society because I think music and all the arts are being sort of squeezed out but they help us to make us a fully rounded person and I believe that they are fundamentally human. I personally believe in a creator god and, and my belief is that if we're created, we are intrinsically creative beings and we need that outlet to express that creativity. Absolutely. I, and I do think there's something going on there at a level that we know on a molecular level that we may not fully be able to comprehend consciously, but we know it. I, I can tell you of, of a, a moment that lives with me forever. And it was, oh, I guess it had to have been sometime in the 80s. James Taylor was giving a free concert in Central Park in New York City. Great big open field. It didn't start until six in the evening, but my friends and I got there at noon so that we could get as close to the stage as possible. And we set out some blankets. We brought food. We had Frisbees. We made a day of it. And then the concert began and I'd been facing the stage for hours. When the music began, I took a moment and turned around and looked behind me. And Emma, there must have been 100,000 people in that park. It was an ocean of humanity and not an, an inch to spare. And it was a, a lovely, lovely little sunset evening. The sky was just starting to turn kind of pink and orange as he was getting to the end of the concert. And he closed the concert with Fire and Rain. It's a song. If you lived anywhere near that era, you know that song. It's a beautiful, beautiful song. And he kept the music very soft. There were 100,000 people softly singing that song in Central Park as the sun was going down and they were singing it with quiet reverence in their voices. And I remember being so overwhelmed. I remember feeling like my heart swelling going, this is a moment that's going to be with me for the rest of my life. All of us were one in that moment. All of us were connected to something 
way beyond our ability to consciously process in that moment. And I'd be willing to bet my last dollar that there isn't a single person that was there in that moment that doesn't have that same memory. Like that was something extraordinary that happened. So precious. It's the same thing when you go to any concert, if it's a music that you love and you're familiar with already, do you notice that it's different than when someone invites you to go hear music that you haven't been previously exposed to? You're surrounded by people that are like rah rahing, and you're like, I don't know any of this. <laughs> it yeah. feels so different, doesn't it? Oh, definitely. I think that whole social aspect and the connection um, and the camaraderie of like fellow fans is beautiful. And you, you do feel it's like almost tribal. For sure. But, uh, it's not on a conscious level. Yes, we all know the music and we all know the words, but there's something else going on there that I think mm -hmm. is um, is core to our existence. And by the way, you did say it was about being human, but I just have to say how much I enjoy watching YouTube videos of cockatoos enjoying rock and roll music. Oh, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, and I just really re wanted to say as well, because when you, you were talk saying that, I was thinking about elephants and yes. I, wanted to I wanted to share about the elephant orchestra in Thailand. Um, I'm really passionate about elephants. I love them. And there is a place in Thailand, I've not been, elephants that um, were once used in logging and things like that and who are quite emotionally scarred they have been given the opportunity to almost receive, well, they are receiving therapy. There's an elephant art school. I've seen uh, videos of the elephants painting, yes. I have a painting. Do from you? There that my lovely husband got for one of my birthdays. Uh, I, I, I'm sure that I can see an elephant in it. I'm sure it's <laughs> a self-portrait of her. <laughs> but the other thing is they had an orchestra. And you can buy CDs, I have some, of the Elephant Orchestra, and you can, again, watch videos of them. They're playing percussion instruments. And there's one bit that just makes me smile. There's one elephant who's got a big beater in his trunk, and he's got a big piece of metal, and he bangs it exuberantly <laughs> it's like thunder like you know those those sort of sounds but it's the joy and like you just said there the joy of the cockatoos there's definitely something they do you don't have to be human to have that joy it's the rhythm of the cosmos it's the it's it, yeah sound vibration for those that go that tend more toward you know new agey sort of things it's all about how everything in the universe vibrates. Yeah. And it's when we come into a sync, I think, with certain vibrations that we're able to respond. Now, I don't go very deeply into that field personally, but I've been exposed to, you know, some of those videos where they pu put some kind of a sand on a surface and they put a a vibration through it and it forms geometric patterns. Beautiful patterns. Yes, and there's something going on well. there. That's not accidental that's the mm -hmm. mathematics of the cosmos it's something that is that moves through all of us at a molecular level i truly oh, feel that way yeah. i don't understand it but i no. feel it you know i i love that as well um the whole like the fibonacci sequence for sure yes that's that is found on the piano but it's the same as the snail shells and there's a massive connection between music and maths Mm -hmm. that, that's one of the things that is true and funny um, thing because I was never good at math but always loved music so I don't know where the discord is there if I can use a musical term <laughs> oh well done <laughs> I, I wasn't a brilliant mathematician either certainly not with like mental arithmetic uh, that's what I think it is it might be a left and right hemisphere thing where to do the math you have to have to engage your left but to mm. experience music, all you need is your soul, you know, I think. <laughs> Tell me, how is it different and how is it similar for you uh, working globally and working online as opposed to in person? Wow, yes. So it's opened new doors, literally new places in the world. Back in the pandemic, I had some students 
across Europe and also I was teaching a friend's daughter all the way over in Tanzania. Wow. Um, <laughs> but I still teach some students in America, um, which is wonderful because that never would have happened. I wouldn't have thought of that, but it's really exciting. It, it works. I actually do most of my teaching online over Zoom like this, using a good microphone and there's not too much of a delay. I've had great success with students, you know, some of them preparing for performances, some of them doing music examinations. This, some of them have actually taken online exams, not through myself, but through organisations that I enter them for. And it's been a completely different experience of what they've had to do rather than go in person. They've had to make video recordings of their playing and send them. It's been a bit difficult because of perfectionism. People just want to do it again and again and again and are cross with themselves when it's not right. Whereas if you did it in person, you don't have that option because it's like on the day. So that was interesting. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is it sometimes can be frustrating, particularly if someone's instrument is out of tune and they can't really tune it very well themselves. It's quite hard to talk it over rather than saying, here, let me show you. Yes, sure. Or bad habits that people get into, particularly with string playing, violinists, when you want to help them with a body position. That's harder. Sure. Online. But it still works. Are you working mostly with adults now or all ages? All ages. Um, I, I do teach from sort of five, six-year-olds up to there's no limit, really. How do people find you? Is it just a word of mouth thing? So in the old days when it was just local, it was more word of mouth. But since the last two years, I have a big online presence. Um, I created myself a website, which I can share with you. And I have Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn business pages. So I'm out there. Yes. And are you accepting new students right now? Yes, I, I do have some space, particularly in the daytime in the UK, because I'm in the UK. So at the moment, our time is British summertime. The evenings or the after school bit onwards is a bit chock-a-block. But um, if there's anybody sort of freer in that daytime, particularly online, that's definitely available. Yes. Now, as I understand, in addition to the tutoring, you also have a coaching workshop that you do. Would you like to share a little bit about what that looks like? Oh, yes. So I'm also a life coach alongside my music teaching and I work with clients again, in person, locally, but also online, internationally. And I also run a free workshop, which is all about SMART goals, because I found SMART goals really helpful in my life. And they can apply to all aspects of our life, including music practice, or a, perhaps a musical goal that you want to achieve. But it could be any aspect of your life. And when you say SMART goals, you're talking about a brand. You're talking about S-M-A-R-T in all capital letters. Uh, I know a little bit about that, but without giving your entire workshop away, can you give my audience just a little sense of what they could expect if they participated in such a workshop? Yes, it was actually developed by two people in the 1980s. It's an acronym. And the letters stand for words. I take my own slight variation to add to it. So the S is specific. The M is measurable. The A, which originally was attainable, I have two for that. I have achievable, which is attainable, but also accountability. Because I think that's really important. That's key, yeah. That we're not on our own. 
Then we have R and again I've got two for this which is relevant. Is it relevant to your big picture goal? But also is it realistic? A bit like what we were saying earlier about the X factor. Yes. You know, is, is it realistic for you? And then the last one is time bound. So the, what time frame are you going to achieve this in? So it's a way of being a bit more direct and focused rather than woolly pie in the sky type of like like New Year resolution type goals. Right. This or just this. or just saying I, I just kind of vaguely want to be famous, you know, or something yeah. like that. Yeah. So all of those words pertain to goal setting. Uh, and okay. how to figure out what your goals really are, how maybe to break those down into yes. more manageable baby steps, smaller bites, so that you have a greater chance at success. And you're saying you do a workshop that is free of cost? Yes, that's right. It's sort of a, a taster to see how I work with my coaching clients. Yeah. So for anyone that's interested, where would you direct them? There will be links in the show notes, uh, but please tell us where people can find you if they'd like to know more. The best place that houses everything really is my website, which is musicaldiamond.com. And that has all about what I do musically and coaching wise. And it also has the links to all my other social pages. Um, I did just want to quickly just say one thing that I have that you can also find the link to on there, which is my Facebook group, which is also called The Musical Diamond. It's a free, a free group and in it we look at the whole of music and how it relates to our learning, life and health. And every week we look at a different topic. So, um, yeah, we I do a live show every week. And, um, yeah, I'd love people to find that as well. I will add to that that since uh, meeting you and welcoming you as a guest, uh, I've popped in there and I, you don't have to have any necessarily any musical uh, aspirations in your life in order to benefit from that group. I think all you need is... Uh, an appreciation for music. I've been uh, personally blessed by some of the things that I've uh, seen in that group. Uh, so I would encourage anybody just to pop over there. Uh, it's a group of people that love music and want to talk about how uh, it touches our lives in so many ways. I know you're also working on a book right now. Where are you in that process? I'm still writing at the moment, but it's a book all about music and well-being. And I'm looking at five major aspects, which is how music relates to our mental health, our physical health, our emotional health, our spiritual health and our social health. And each of those will have different bits branching off them as well. Would you call it more of a study or more of like a self-help book? Is it something with takeaways for the readers? Yeah, yeah, it's a non-fiction book and it's going to be giving you information, but also it's a self-help book. There's going to be tips at the end of every chapter. Yes. I would love to have you back when that book is going to be available for purchase and talk a lot more about that. I can see we could do an entire episode on that topic. Uh it's so in keeping with what I'm trying to accomplish with the podcast. So I'm cheering you on and uh, you. wishing you the very best. And I know that writing projects always take a lot longer than we anticipate when we start, but keep going. It's a worthy thing that you're doing. I want to thank you for joining me today and having a wonderful conversation. I've enjoyed it immensely. And I do hope we have another opportunity to do it in the future. Thank you. Likewise, Lynn. Thank you for inviting me to share. What a delightful person. And I love that someone with so much classical training can still have a conversation with this old hippie lady uh, about rock and roll. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. And as my parting thought today, I'd like to share with you just a little snippet. Maybe you grew up with the Velveteen Rabbit as one of your favorite childhood stories. Do you know, I never did. I actually read it for the first time in my life just about a week ago. And there's this little quote 
from it that I'd like to share with you today. It has to do with what makes us real. And it goes like this. You become, it takes a long time. That's why it doesn't happen often to people who break easily or have sharp edges or who have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off and your eyes drop out of you and you get loose in your joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all because once you are real, you can't be ugly except to people who don't understand. So I want to leave you with love and be loved. That's what makes the world go round. And I hope that you find somebody to love today or somebody to receive love today from. Thanks for watching. Come on back and I will see you next time. Cool Gray in Studio A is a fine-tuned services production. It exists for entertainment purposes and is not intended to be used as a sole source of information or advice on any subject. Find and follow this podcast at coolgraystudios.com.